here. Um, Joey texted me this morning, and he was not feeling well, and so he, 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 he begged me. He's like, AJ, please. He's like, can you, can you help me? I'm, I'm not feeling well, and I, I can't just, you know, l- let my church down here. And so I said, no problem. We were actually planning on being in Madeira tomorrow anyway. So it worked out just, it worked out just perfectly. So uh, good to be here with you all. Good to, good to see you. It's, it's, been, uh, it's been a blessing the last, you know, how God's been working in the last uh, month or so. He... Uh, been, been able to get married to Shama. She's, she's great, and uh, we're just continuing uh, to do the Youth Rush ministry and uh, working with uh, young people around the area here, and uh, God has been really good. So I'm glad to come and revisit my family here. It's always good to see. You know, it was funny. We drove into the parking lot this morning, and I, I'm like, oh, that's, uh, that's Barbara Duvall's car. Oh, that's Irene's car. Oh, that, you know, so, but I noticed a few new cars out there, so that's good to see, too. Um, but it's good. It's just good to be here and see all the familiar faces. I wasn't planning on on, on speaking when I got up this morning, uh, so my message today is I'm going to share with you just something I've been I've been studying uh, as of late. Something that God has kind of you know been speaking to me through, and uh, I pray it'll be a blessing to you. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ma- uh, Mark uh, chapter 12, and we will get into the Word this morning. But first, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful morning. Thank you for the sun, the warm weather. And uh, we just pray that your Holy Spirit will uh, fill our hearts, that the sun of righteousness will fill our hearts, and that you will, you'll guide us each specifically, Lord, that you'll speak to us each personally. You have, uh, there's, there's one sermon this morning, but there's many messages for every, every individual here. And so I pray that your Holy Spirit will, will speak and that our hearts and ears will be open. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, so, so Mark chapter 12, we're going to look at a familiar story, a story that a lot of people have, you know, have talked about over the years, but uh, hopefully kind of look at, at a new aspect of it. There's, there's, a, there's a certain aspect of this, of this passage here that I just, I, I just kind of puzzled and scratched my head over and, and, and studied for years, and I never really got it. But at recently, I feel like I feel like something kind of hit me. I feel like I feel like I'm starting I, I'm starting to understand what what Jesus is trying to say here. So this this Mark chapter twelve, just to give you some kind of the background, this is a point in Jesus' ministry in his life when he's got a lot of enemies who are coming at him with with all kinds of arguments. And the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, these scribes, these lawyers, they all have these tough loaded questions that they're asking Jesus, trying to get him to, to stumble and trip so they have something to accuse him with. And so they're, they're, here we are in, in Mark 12, 18, and the Sadducees are coming at him with, with a question that they think he won't be able to answer, and they're going to be able to you know, make him look bad in front of his followers, in front of the people. But Christ always had the perfect comeback, cause, and, and we'll see why here in a second. So, so look at, at, at uh, Mark chapter 12, and verse 18, and here it says, Then some of the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and they asked him, saying, So what do, what do, the, what do the Sadducees believe about the afterlife? What is their main take? There's no afterlife. Yeah, there's no resurrection. Okay? So, so they kind of had, it was, I guess, I guess you could kind of say, almost like, like a secular uh, kind of view on things. Um, back then, they didn't really have, you know, if, if the Sadducees were alive today, they, they might call themselves like maybe an agnostic. That's probably what they would call themselves. But back then, they didn't really, you know, they didn't really think like that. So they were, they were Jews, but they, they had, you know, a lot of skeptical viewpoints about, uh, and secular viewpoints about God and about the Bible. So they don't believe in an afterlife. And so, you know, Jesus, he, he's talking about resurrection and talking about going to heaven and that kind of thing. And so here they come to challenge him on that. And then notice this, notice this scenario, this picture that they paint here. They say in verse 19, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind and leaves no children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Okay. So that's, a, that's something you can read about in the Old Testament. Moses, it was one of the, 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 the laws they had back then was if, if, a, if, a, if, a, if a man dies and leaves no, no children, his, his brother 
an unmarried brother uh, should come and take care of it, marry his, his, his widowed wife and take care of her and, and, and raise up children and so forth. So, so they're just reminding Jesus of that. Now notice what they say in verse 20. Now, thank you, let there be light. Verse 20, now there were seven brothers. Okay, notice this, this okay, they're, they're just creating this, this imaginary scenario. Now, there were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and dying, he left no offspring. And the second took her, okay? So the, so the brother died, then the other brother comes and, and takes her as his wife. And he died, nor did he leave any offspring, and the third likewise. Something, something wrong with this lady here. There are, all the guys keep dying here. Verse, verse 22, so the seven had her and left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be? For all seven had her as wife. Okay, this is, this is a, funny, a funny thing that they're, do, they're doing here. But basically, they're, they're just saying they don't believe in a resurrection. But they, they understand and they, they all abide by this rule that if a, man, if a man dies, his brother should come and take care of, of the wife. Okay? And so, and so in their minds, they're like, well, this is just, this, you know, this, this is just proof that there can be no afterlife. Because if, if they're all raised, like how can all, all seven of them be, be uh, married to her? They can't. Therefore, therefore, there can't be an afterlife. That's what, they're, that's what the Sadducees are, are trying to communicate to Jesus. Kind of, kind of weird thinking, kind of a weird way to come at it, but it seems weird to us, but that's, that was their logic, and that's how they were challenging Christ. So, so they, 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 they say this to Jesus, and now Jesus, he's, he's, you know, he's supposedly put in, in, a, in a hard place here. Everybody's looking to Christ. What will he say? You know, how can, how, what, what could be the answer to this? Everybody's scratching their head. They're like, man, how can there be a resurrection? Because they all can't be married to her, right? Now notice what Jesus says. Verse 24, Jesus always had the perfect answer. He says in verse 24, Jesus answered and said to them, Are you not therefore mistaken? Because you do not know the scriptures, nor the power of God. Okay, so this is kind of how he starts off. First thing he does, before he gives them an answer, he, he, he just he lets them know. He says, you are very greatly mistaken. You don't, you don't understand what's really going. You don't understand. You don't get it for two reasons. Number one, you don't know the Bible. And number two, you don't know the power of God. Very interesting thing here. When we don't know the Bible, we can come to some really interesting conclusions about life. Our take on life, our perspective on how the world works and how heaven works and how God works, it can really be weird if we don't know the Bible and we don't know the power of God. I had a friend who was doing cold hoarding, who was doing canvassing uh, over in Las Vegas. And, and just so you know, cold hoarding or canvassing, that's where you go, you go door to door and you sell books about, you know, spiritual religious books to people, you know, to, to lead them to God. So he was, he, was, he was actually in some businesses and he was going from these business to business with this bag of books. He was selling the books to people, books like Steps to Christ and, and Desire of Ages and so forth, Great Controversy. And, and he goes to, into this business, and he meets this guy, the, this owner of this small store. He, he comes, and, he, and, and this guy, this owner, looks at my friend. His name is Chris. And he, and he looks at him, and he says, hey, what do you got there? And, and, he, and he starts to pull out a book. And then the guy, he looks at, the, at some of the titles of the books, and he immediately realizes that my friend is, is a religious person. He's, a, you know, he's got these Christian books that are obviously Christian. And the guy's like, Hey, you, you can stop right there. I, you know, I, I really don't believe in that stuff. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I have, I have a different take on things and, and so, but, but thanks for, you know, it's, thanks for coming by. And so my friend, Chris, he's all of a sudden, he's like, oh man, what do I say? You know, he, he starts praying in his head. He's like, God help, you know, help me know what to say. So my friend, Chris, he, you know, he's trying to think fast on his feet and he just says, well, hey, no worries, no problem, sir. You know, I don't want to, you know, be pushy or anything. Um, but, but Hey, you know, I like to be open-minded. So, uh, Tell me, what, what is your take? How, how do you see things? I like to, you know, just hear other people's perspective. And the guy said, well, you know what? All right, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I think. I'll tell you what, how, what I really think about lives. And, and the guy leans forward and he looks at my friend in the eyes. And, and this guy, is, he's, he's a coherent, intelligent man. Okay, this is a normal person. And he says with all sincerity, he says, 
I believe in aliens. I believe in aliens. And my friend Chris kind of is like, whoa, what, what exactly do you mean by that? And, and, and he's like, this guy just starts going on. He's like, boom, 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 boom. He's like, did you see this in the news and that in the news? Did you see these patterns? Aliens are influencing human affairs. Think about Area 51. Think about Roswell. Think about this. Think about that. And, he, and, and, and this, guy, this guy goes on this whole thing and presenting all these, you know, stories and, and, and evidence about how he believes aliens are, are you know, part... Uh, of, 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 the, of the universe, and he says, aliens put us here on earth, and they're trying to communicate with us. They're trying to help set us straight because we're so, things are so messed up on earth here, and my friend's like, true, true, true. Aliens are trying to help, help get us back on track, and, 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 and so this guy's talking about aliens. He's, again, he owns a business. He's an, he's an intelligent person, but guess what? He doesn't know the Bible. He doesn't know the power of God, and he has a very interesting view and perspective on life. Because when you don't know the Bible and you don't know the power of God, you get some pretty strange conclusions about life. So notice this. My friend is praying and he's like, God, give me, give me words to say here. And a verse popped into his head, a Bible verse. And, and, it's, and it's a verse from Hebrews where it says, we are pilgrims and we are strangers. This earth, this world is not our home. We're aliens. That's what he's, my friend is thinking in his head. And, he, and, and it just hit him all of a sudden. And he looks at this guy and he says, sir, I have something to tell you. And this guy's like, what? And he says, I am one of those aliens. <laughs> and the guy kind of steps back and he gasps and he's like, you can't, what? You can't be. And he says, yes, I am. He's thinking, you know, it's, it's, it's true. This world is not his home. Heaven is our home. And he's, he's an alien here, okay? So he's, he says, I'm, 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 an a, I'm an alien, and I'm here today with a message for you. And, and, he, and, he, and the guy's like, really? <laughs> and he says, he says to him, he says to him, sir, you're, you're, you, you almost have it, but you're off on a few things. And he's like, this book is going to help you understand. And he pulls out the great controversy and hands it to him. And the guy's like, but, but this, is, this is that Christ, religious Christian stuff. And he says, this is the true stuff. This is it. The aliens communicate, are, are trying to speak to us through the Bible. A lot, you, you need to read this book. And the guy's like, really? And he, and he looks at it and he, see, you know, he, sees, he flips through it and he looks and he says, I'll take it. And he reaches in, he gets the money and he's like, I'll read this, thank you. And, he, and then he, then he you know, he, he, he says, he says some, some other stuff like, he's like, so are you from, like, what planet are you from or whatever? And my friend's like, don't worry about it. You know, it's like, just read this book. <laughs> and then he, then he leaves. And by God's grace, he's going to read that book and hopefully get his, get his mind straightened out. Amen? It's so, it's so interesting, the ideas that people have about life and, and the conclusions we come up with when we don't know the Bible. When you study the Bible things start to make sense. The, the, the fuzzy picture starts, to, the puzzle pieces start coming together, the fuzzy vision becomes more and more clear, progressively. The more we know about the word of God and the more we know of the power of God. So, so Jesus, he goes on, in verse 24 here, we're in Mark 12. Jesus answered and said to them, are you not therefore mistaken because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. Now, this is not, not a, a message or a sermon here on marriage. And a lot of, I've had people come to me kind of disturbed about this. They're like, what, what does that mean exactly? Well, in all honesty, the Bible does not speak a lot about this, about this topic. It doesn't. But all I can say is, God, he, he never takes away something from us without giving us something better in return. Amen? And by faith, we know that, that God has something great in store for us when we get to heaven. So things, are, things you know, may not be exactly like they are here. We don't know. So, so, so now here's the, here's the next point. When we, when we, uh, we, we, have to not only, we have to not only search the scriptures, but we have to have faith in God in order to, in order to understand uh, how things work here. So I, I'm going to share an illustration with you about, about fi having faith in God. And in order to do, when I share this illustration, I, 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 I don't always know what I've shared because, you know, I've spoken here a number of times in Madeira, and so forgive me if I share a story or something that I've shared here before. 
But I want you to imagine with me here that you live in an in a apartment, okay? Maybe some of you do. You live in an apartment, and you live in the second story of the apartment, and you're up in the, up in the second story, and you, you walk into your, your living room, and you kick back on the couch one day, and you're just kind of relaxing, and you fall asleep. And as you're, as you're there on the apart, in the apartment, you're sleeping, and then all of, you're, you know, you're just having this nice dream. All of a sudden, you, you, you're startled awake, and you, you smell. You smell smoke. And you get up, and you, and you look, look around, and you run to, the, to your front door, and you're like, what is that smell? And you open the front door, and the entryway to your apartment, like the stairwell coming up to it, is engulfed in flames and smoke. And you're like, uh-oh, and you slam the door shut. And you run over to the window, and you throw open the window, and you look out, and you see smoke billowing out from under the building. Sure enough, the building is burning down, and you're trapped in the second story of the apartment. So, so you look out and you see in the parking lot all the occupants of the apartment, all the residents are out there, and your own family is out there in the parking lot too. They all escaped and they forgot to tell you. And so now here you are stuck all by yourself and you, and you see them out there and you're like, thanks guys. And, and you look and you see, you see the firemen down there and they, they're trying to put the fire out but it's, it's too far gone and they can't. And so you say, help, help, help. And out from behind the fire truck walks a fireman. And the fireman walks up under the window and he looks up at you. And the fireman holds out his arms and he says, jump and I'll catch you. Jump and I'll catch you. Now, let me ask you this. This is a good illustration of what faith is. In order to jump into that fireman's arms, you have to have some measure of faith. You have to have faith to jump in his arms. Faith means trusting, right? Faith means acting upon the word like, if you have trust in God, you're going to act upon his word, right? You're going to act upon the word of the fireman if you have faith in him. If you have no faith in him, you're not going to. But now, let me just, let me just add this detail here. You look at the fireman, and this fireman just so happens to be the weakest, skinniest, boniest fireman you've ever seen in your life. Like, this dude's, this dude's legs are like, his arms are like toothpicks. His knees are knocking together. And, and he looks up and he says, jump and I'll catch you. And he's, and he's holding out his arms, and you're like, no, I'm not going to jump, because if I, you're, you're like, if I jump, we're both going to die. I'm going to kill him, and I'm going to die too. And so you have no faith in this fireman. It's like, I can't have faith in this guy. I don't have faith in this guy. And so you say, next fireman, please. And, and, and out from behind the fire truck comes another fireman, except this time, this fireman is built like a tank. Like you hear him like, and he walks out under, underneath the window and his biceps are as large as your head. And he looks up at you and he says, jump and I'll catch you. Oh, like that. He even grunts. And you look down and you're like, I can have faith in this fireman. I can have faith in this guy. And, and, and you jump and no problem. He catches you. What makes the difference here? Why is it easier to have faith in the second fireman than the first fireman? Well, obviously, because the, the, the second fireman, you can see he has these big, strong arms. And when he says, I'll catch you, you can trust it. You can believe it. Here's the thing about God. Can we see God? No, he's invisible. So in order to have faith in God, we have to see him with, with the eye of faith, with the, with the mind's eye. We have, to, we have to trust in him who is invisible. And in order to do that, we have to, we have to know him. Now, go, turn with me really fast. If you can hold your finger here in Mark 12, turn with me to Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Romans 10 and verse 17. And notice, notice what it says here. Um, it says, so then, in Romans 10 verse 17, Paul says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So in order to get faith, in God, you study about God in the, in the Bible, right? Why does that give you faith? Well, because of this. Naturally, we all are born with weak faith. When we think about God, we think of him in terms of a weak, skinny fireman. And we're like, we're, we're, we're afraid to trust him. He says, he, he, his word tells us to do this, to obey him, to trust him, to follow him, to, 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 you know, to have peace and, and trust that he is going to take care of us. It's hard to do that, though, and, and we try to take things into our own hands because our faith is weak. But the more we study about God, the more we, we, we read about him, the more our picture of God changes. And we see God is not a weak, skinny fireman. He's a big, strong fireman who, when he says, jump and I'll catch you, 
he can really catch us. Amen? So here's the thing. We need to, re- we need to study the Word of God so that we, that we, we don't get messed up, messed up ideas about, about the world and how God works. And we need to study it so that our, we can actually trust God and have faith in him. So, so the Sadducees have a problem here because in verse 24, Jesus says, you're mistaken because you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. And you simply have to have faith and trust that God's going to take care of the marriage thing uh, when we get to heaven. But now, moving on here. Okay, now we're going to move on to the part that used to perplex me for, for many years. Verse 26, but concerning the dead... Okay, so I'm sorry, we're back in Mark chapter 12, verse 26, and Jesus, he's talking to the Sadducees. So he says, but concerning the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses in the burning bush passage how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. This verse is weird. Okay, when I first read this, I was like, what in the world is he trying to say? What on earth is he trying to say? Let me read it to you one more time, and then I'll explain to you what my, what my, what my you know, perplexity was. Verse 26, concerning the dead, we're talking about the, about the dead here and about resurrection, okay? But concerning the dead, that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the burning bush passage, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You there are therefore greatly mistaken. Now, when I first read this, here's what confused me. We know that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are dead. So what, if you read this, this, this passage at face value, it almost seems like Jesus is saying, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive. He's the God of, of the living. In, in these, that's what it almost looks like at face value. And that kind of, I'm like, that's, that can't be what he's saying because the Bible makes clear in other, other passages that these guys are, are, are dead. They're not still alive. So what, what is Jesus trying to say? Well, the reason that it's kind of a, a, of a confusion for some of us is because we, we kind of know nowadays there is, there is kind of a, a debate, right, about, about the state of the dead. Are, are, the, are dead people really dead or are they, are they up in heaven right now or are they going to be resurrected when Jesus comes? There's, there, you know, and so with that, that kind of mindset, you, you read this and you're like, wait a second, what is, what is Jesus saying? That these guys died and went straight to heaven? That's not what he's saying at all. I want you to notice something. The, the burning bush passage, notice what he says right here. He says, I am the God of Abraham the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. What, what is Jesus emphasizing right here? What is Jesus trying to emphasize? What is, his, what is the point? Like if Jesus were reading this, what would, he, like, what, what would his voice sound like when he said to that, when he was speaking to them? He was saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of J- Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Instead of saying, I was the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, in the God, or the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Think about this with me for a second. You have to think. You have to, this is where you gotta put, we got to put on our thinking caps here for a second. The Sadducees, their faith in God and in their knowledge of the Bible was so weak that when they thought about God, they thought of him in terms of the, he was the great I was. Yeah, God, he did great things in the past, he did great, you know, we read these incredible stories in the past. He was great. And, and maybe he will be great. He, he, I, he's the great I will be. That's how they, that's how they thought. That was, that was their problem. Their, that was the core, the root of their problem. When, when they thought about God, they thought about in, him in terms of he's the great I was instead of he is the great I am, the God of here and now and present the I am of your life. This is the problem that the Sadducees had. I have a question for you. When you think about God and when you come to church, what is he to you? Is he the great I was? Is he the great I will be? Someday he's going to come, come, you know, with, with great power and the Holy Spirit and he's going to do this and that. But today, it's, things are just kind of, you know, not, not really much action going on right now. Jesus is saying, God is so powerful, he's so powerful, that it's as if Abraham, 
Isaac and Jacob were alive right now. They're dead, but it's as if they're going to be alive right now because God is going to resurrect them. He's the, he is, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I am the God of right now. Friends, we have to, we have to, we have to question ourselves and we have to look at ourselves sometimes and say, how am I relating to God? Am I relating to him like he's the great I was? Or am I actually looking to God and expecting him to work in powerful ways even today, even right now? I'll share with you. I mean, there's so many stories that could be shared. I want to share with you one story that, that when I struggle sometimes to think about, like, God, where are you? You are the great I, you, you, to me, you feel like the great I was right now. I remember this story, and it helps me so much. When I was, a few years ago, Five, six, uh, it was, I think it was even before I came to Madeira, I was going, I was going door to door and I was doing the coal portering thing. And as I was, I was doing it, I was in a tough neighborhood. There's some neighborhoods where it seems like, it seems like everybody's grumpy. I, I don't know how that, that happens, but I was going from door to door to door to door and I went all morning long for hours without a single sale. Nobody was in, not only did people not buy my books, they weren't even interested. I could barely, you know, put a book in somebody's hand for them to look at it. And I went on and on and on like this. And then finally I got so fed up and frustrated. I'm like, God, why, why, what am I doing here? Why am I here? And I, and I went out to the sidewalk. I was in a neighborhood, you know, a nice neighborhood, sidewalk. And, and I, I, I took my bag of books that I was carrying and I threw it down on the ground. I knelt down on the sidewalk and I started praying. People were walking by, kind of like raising their eyebrows, like, what's up with this dude? Cars were driving by. It was, it was awkward. I didn't care. I said, God, what, what's going on out here? Why am I, you know, why am I doing this? There's, there's no point. Like, like, did you, you know, I started, I was questioning him and I was praying and I was pleading with God. Finally, I, I, I got up, I picked up my bag of books and I went to the next door. I knocked on the door and this lady opens the door and I, I pulled out a book and guess what? It was the same thing. Like, no, I'm not really interested. No, no thanks. I, sorry, you know, have a nice day. And then I was kind of like, you know, you know, not surprised. It was kind of what I'd been experiencing all morning. But then all of a sudden, something clicked. She kind of like, like a light bulb went off in her head or something. And she looked at me and she looked at the books and she's like, wait, let me see that. And she, ta- and she takes it and she's like, I'll take everything you have. And I'm like, right, put on the brakes. I'm like, and I kind of stuttered and stumbled. And I'm like, what? what? And, then, and then she's like, she, and then she, then she proceeds to write a check for, for almost $200 and hands it to me and says, I hope this helps you with your schooling. And, and, she, and she takes all my books. And I'm like, what in the world is going on right here? You know, and I, and I start walking away and I'm like, the very door afterward, God, 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 his, his, his spirit stepped in and worked in a powerful way. It occurred to me right then and there that when we get serious with God, he gets serious with us. When we get serious with God, he gets serious with us. We, 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 we can't keep going on in our lives and expecting, you know, we can't just keep going on and, and saying, you know, he's the great I was, he's the great I will be. We have to come to God and in our prayers and in our, in our, in our, our walk with him, we have to come to him as, as if he's the great I am and we have to pray and, and, and expect him to do great things today. And when we get serious with him, he gets serious with us and he starts working in our lives. We start seeing, seeing mountains m- moved. We start, we start seeing people's, people's hearts changed. We start seeing obstacles in our family removed. But we can't, we can't expect those things as long as we're thinking of him as the great I was or the great I will be. I want to share with you one last story as we close. Actually, I want to, I want to share this quote with you and then, then one last story. So this is from a book called The Desire of Ages. This is one of the books I used to sell, uh, going door to door, a powerful book about the life of Christ, Desire of Ages, page 348.2. She says this. Now, catch what she says here. It is for our own benefit to keep every gift of God fresh in our memory. Okay? What does it mean to keep something fresh in your memory? You know, it's like you, you remember it, you rehash it, you think about it, and you keep it fresh in your memory. You know, you don't let the cobwebs, you know, get over it. Thus, she says, thus, thus is faith strengthened to claim and receive more and more. 
She says this, now catch this, there is greater encouragement for us in the least blessing we ourselves receive from God than in all the accounts we can read of the faith and experience of others. You catch what she's saying there? There's more, there's more encouragement for us when we think about the things that God has done for us personally than all the stories and th- great things we read about in, of other people's lives. So the point here, the point is this. When your faith is getting weak, when, you're, when you are, are like thinking in terms of uh, the great I was or the great I will be, think back to a time when God worked in your life. I know for a fact in every, every person's life here, God has worked at some time in the past in a powerful way. And when you think of those things, those things strengthen your faith more so than anything else you can, other story you can hear or, or hear about or, or learn about. Think about how God has worked in the past and it will give you strength to expect him and, 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 and give you faith for him to be able to work powerfully today. So with, with that in mind, I want to share with you one last story about, about faith here. It says, uh, this is a story um, from the 19, or it was a story from Vietnam. And it's a story about a, a young man who, his name was Hien, he was Vietnamese, and he was a Christian. And when, when uh, during the Vietnam War, a, an eva- uh, evangelists, American evangelists, or, or chaplains, would, would come with the American troops and these guys would come and they would, the, the American evangelists would preach the word to prisoners of war. And they would preach the word to, to you know, to uh, the, the Vietnamese soldiers that were on the American side. And, and, and this guy, he and this young man, he was a convert to Christianity and he would translate for the American evangelists. All during the Vietnam War, he, he, went, he went with them and, and he would translate and translate and translate and he himself would even preach the word of God, this, this young man, he and one day... Uh, finally, when the American troops withdrew, Hien was caught by the Viet Cong. And that was, that was the, the, those were the bad guys. They caught him and they put him into, a, into, a, um, into a, a, a camp where he was a prisoner of war and he was treated very despicably there. He was you know, kept in the most you know, disgusting conditions where he, he had to stay in a dark you know, cell and, and the, thing, the thing about the Viet Cong was they not only locked him up, but they, they, they kind of uh, mentally abused him because they knew that they figured out that he liked to read English. They, they, they realized he was a Christian. They took all of his Bibles away and, and they, wouldn't, they, they told him, they said, we're, we're going to smack you around if you try to speak English. And so he had no, he, you know, he had no Bible and he had, he had, he had nothing and he was, he was treated cruelly every day. And finally, it just kept wearing and wearing on him until finally one day, he was so miserable, he was so tired, he was so worn that he said to himself, God, where are you? I don't, I don't know if I can take, I can't take this anymore. I can't keep going to bed, you know, thinking about God and praying about God and hoping that God will do something someday. He went to bed one night and he told himself, that's it. No more God. I'm done with you, God. No more, no more evening prayers. No more, no more thoughts about God. I'm gonna, I'm, he's like, I give up. And he went to bed that night, an atheist. He woke up the next morning, and the, uh, the, the prison warden came by, and the, 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 the commander who was in charge of his, his area, I guess, he came by and he told he said he looked at him and he said, he and today you're going to clean the latrines. Hien cringed inside because he knew that the latrines were the, that was the most disgusting job that anybody could do. Uh, and it was just a filthy place. And so he, he, you know, when the time came, he went in there to the latrines and he was, he was having to clean the toilets and clean, you know, clean up the, the, the filth and the trash. He came to a trash can in the, in the latrines there. He came and, he, and, and in this trash can, something caught his eye. He saw a piece of paper and on that piece of paper, he saw words in the English language. And this kind of got him excited because he, he, you know, he loved to read things in English. He grabbed that piece of paper and, it, and he rinsed off the filth and, 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 he, and he quickly you know, tucked it in his pocket, making sure nobody saw what he was doing. And he just kept cleaning. That evening, when he got back you know, into his cell and he got into bed, he covered up. And when everybody was gone to bed, 
he pulled that little piece of paper out that he had tucked in and he pulled out a flashlight and he turned on the flashlight and it was a page from the Bible. And when he looked at that, he looked at, he looked at, he looked at where the passage was from and the passage was from Romans chapter 8. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 8. I'm going to share with you exactly what he and saw when he turned his flashlight on there. Romans chapter 8 and verse 31. Romans chapter 8 and verse 31. In that dark dungeon cell, he and pulled out a page of the Bible and he turned on his flashlight and he looked at Romans chapter 8, 31 and he started reading and here's what it said. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God and makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Verse 37, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He and read that and he immediately began weeping in his bed. He cried and cried and cried and he, and he, and he prayed to God and he said, God, forgive me, for, forgive me for letting go of you. Forgive me. He said, you, would, you wouldn't even let go of me for one day. He's like, forgive me for, for, for just casting you off. He and went to bed that night having, having read that, that page back and front multiple times and, 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 and giving his heart to God again. The next morning he woke up and, and the, the, the officer came by his prison cell and he and said to him, he said, hey, I want to clean the latrines again today. And the, the officer looks at him and he, said, and he, he almost thinks, he kind of takes it like he's being haughty or he's like trying to be snide or, or trying to be cocky or something. And he says, you're going to clean the latrines every day. And, and so, so back he goes. He and goes into the latrines again and he starts scrubbing and cleaning away in the dirtiest place in the, in the, in the prison camp. And he comes to that trash can again, and lo and behold, there's another page of the Bible. Day in and day out, he and cleans those latrines. He, he, he ends up collecting all four of the Gospels, many parts of the New Testament, and, and large ch portions and chunks of the Old Testament. Every day he would go in there and he would, he would collect it, and he would clean it off, and he would use that for his evening devotions. Turns out that the very, the very officer who was in charge of his, of his unit uh, was, was the officer who had a copy of the English Bible and he would rip out pages and use it for toilet paper. And he would throw it in the trash can every day and he would come by, get it, rinse it clean and as clean as you can rinse it and he would take it, take it to bed with him that night and he would read the Bible. Time, time passed and he was actually released and he was, but he was still trapped in the country and he wasn't, you know, no, nobody could leave and, and um, he planned an escape, and it failed. And then he finally, he got in connection with a family that had some money and some wealth. And they planned, they planned an escape, and they used money to buy some materials, and they built a vessel, a ship. And they had it hidden, and, and they, had, they set a, you know, a secret date and time for them to all get together. And they were going to get on this vessel, and they were going to sail away uh, to, to, uh, you know, to a free place where they could get away from, from the Viet Cong. And finally, it was only days before, uh, before you know, they were, they were, their planned escape. And the v two Viet Cong soldiers came and they found he and they caught him and they pressed their guns into his face and they told him, they said, hey, you, you are planning to escape. We know it. Tell us the truth. He and looked at them and he said, no, I, I'm not, I'm not, I promise, I swear, I'm not trying to escape. And they, they, they pressed him, but he denied it and, and, and they and they, they left him alone. He and, he and didn't feel right. Something felt wrong about that. And, and it was, the day came of their departure, and it was literally only, 
It was only hours before their escape came, and the two Viet Cong soldiers came and caught him again. And they pointed their guns in his face, and they told him, You, we know you're planning to escape. Do not, don't deny it. He and prayed to God. He said, God, be with me. Be, 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 be faithful to me, and I'll be, I'll be faithful to you. He looked at them, and he said, It's true. I'm tr- I'm, we're planning to escape. He, to- he, he told them that. They pointed their guns at this young man, and they looked at him, and they said, We want to go with you. We want to go with you. He, and white as a ghost, he's like, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. A couple hours passed. The time came. They got onto their boat along with the two Viet Cong soldiers and they sailed out into the sea. As they were sailing out into the sea, a storm came out and hit the boat and the storm was so terrible and so powerful they were almost shipwrecked. But it just turned out that the two Viet Cong soldiers were sailors. And they were so, they were so skillful that, that they actually were able to navigate through the storm and they made it to Thailand, which is, which is a free country, and eventually made it to America, to, to freedom. And, and he, in reflecting on that, he, he says, had it not been for those two guys with him, they would have died at sea if it hadn't been for the sailing ability of those two guys. The last point I want to leave you with is this. When we struggle in our minds with God and we, we think of him as the great I was or the great I will be, we often try to take things into our own hands. And instead of trusting God and, and being faithful to God and just trusting him implicitly and doing things his way, we, we take things into our own hands. And when we do that, guess what? We short-circuit God's ability to work in our lives. We short-circuit his ability. God, think about the, 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 um, you know, the, the three Hebrew boys in Daniel. Remember when they were cast into the fiery furnace? Well, well what if they had, you know, when the, when the trumpet had sounded, they, 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 they bent down to clip their toenails or something, and, 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 and they, weren't, they escaped, right? God brought them through the fire and worked in a miraculous way because they stood. When we stand, when we stay faithful to God and we do things his way, it, impa- he, it enables him and opens the doors for him to work powerfully in our lives. He's the great I am. He'll work for, he worked for us in the past. He'll work for us in the future. And he will work for us today if we'll trust him. If we'll trust him and we'll be true to him and we'll be faithful to him. So to close, number one, we must search and know the scriptures. Otherwise, we're going to come up with some crazy ideas. We've got to know the scriptures. We've got to trust the power of God and have faith in him. And we got to be true to him and do things his way when it comes, when the rubber meets the road. Let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you so much that you are the great I am. You're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you are the God of Madeira Church. You are the God of every person in this room. And God, you will work for us just like you worked for Jesus, just like you worked for Moses, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I pray that you will give us grace and give us faith to trust you. In Christ's name, amen. All right, our closing song.